Hi everyone, my name is Terry, and welcome to my channel, The Pink Dumbbell Problem, and today's Friday Fact Day episode, which happens to be the 50th episode in this series. Thank you so much to everybody who's been watching and commenting and sharing and liking and subscribing. Can't believe I'm at 50 episodes in FFD, but here we are. So, today's fact is... Agnetology, gender, and comportment. Let's look at how those three things all work together right now. Since it's the 50th episode of FFD, I thought I'm going to go back to the roots of where this whole thing started, this whole channel. And I'm going to really go back to the roots and tell you about some work that was done in the early 1980s by an academic from the USA named Iris Marion Young. If you've ever taken a gender studies course, or maybe if you're an older vintage like me, it used to be called women's studies. If you've ever taken a course in this very high chance you have read Throwing Like a Girl by Iris Marion Young. And that article, amongst many other sources, is one of the sort of founding pieces of my academic work, which of course has evolved over the years into this channel. Now, one of the most pernicious myths around physical activity, sport, fitness, all of those things, and gender, is that girls can't throw well. Boy, is there a lot to unpack around that. Now, today I'm not going to actually get into the details of what makes a good throw versus a bad throw. I don't really have the space in here to throw things around. And I'm going to save that for a future video when I can rent some space. When Iris Marion Young published the article Throwing Like a Girl, it was 1980. So things were pretty much still in the very early days of looking at the difference between how boys and girls, and then eventually as they grew, men and women, operated around physical activity. And she kind of blew the lid off of this one. Young was working with a text from 1966 from a different academic fellow, also from the States, named Irving Strauss. Oh boy. Let's talk about Irving for a moment, shall we? Full caveat here, considering that I'm going to be talking about articles that were written and published in the 60s through to the 1980s, I am going to be primarily talking about cisgendered boys and girls in this. That's who was studied at that time. And the idea that a kid could transition or identify as non-binary wasn't a thing yet. So with all apologies to our modern context and our modern sensibilities, this is a product of its time, so I am going to be talking about cisgendered people being studied. Strauss decided he was going to argue and figure out why this difference happens between boys and girls from such a very young age. His argument was that there is something feminine that is innate in feminine female-bodied persons that makes us incapable of throwing a ball correctly. And by correctly, he was really basing this on sport and kinesiology standards that are still considered the correct throwing technique today. Strauss argued that kids as young as five years old exhibited this distinct sex difference in throwing skills. Therefore, it must be something innate. He figured that children as young as five had not been indoctrinated with social mores and norms and therefore were acting strictly out of their own physical nature. Now, granted, when he published this in 1966, yeah, there wasn't as much TV and media. There certainly wasn't social media. There wasn't computers in the home. But, but even then, by the age of five, yeah, kids really understood gender by then. Like, come on, give the kids some credit. Think about it for a sec. There's a lot a five-year-old can do. And from the moment kids are born, they're observing what goes on in the world. So yeah, five is actually kind of late. But he figured there's no way a girl at the tender age of five could have figured out a feminine way of throwing and therefore embodied it. Fast forward to 1980 and Iris Marion Young went, no, 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 Irving, no, that's not how this works, dear. I don't think that's how Iris Marion Young actually spoke, but in my mind, that's how I hear her voice. Young's idea was that not only are the gender differences installed in us through society, through social norms from well before the age of five, but that they are entirely social norms. These are not things that have anything to do with our anatomy and physiology. One of the things that she talks quite a lot about is the concept of comportment. And that's not a word we hear a whole lot anymore. It used to be quite common, though. Even in the early 80s, I was quite young, but I do remember that sort of being a phrase or a term that was used, particularly to control how women behaved. Of course. So what is comportment? The very basic meaning of comportment is simply how you carry yourself about 
how you appear and behave as a person. That doesn't really give you the full story. The way comportment was used both in society and particularly in Young's article is about what we would today call performance or perhaps depending on how you use the term performativity. I'm not going to go too much into performativity and the different meanings of that word because that really deserves a whole other video. Those ways of performing our feminine identity are comportment. It's how you carry yourself through the world and behave in a particular way. And comportment has always kind of been used to refer to quite often the kinesthetic, less so the appearance side of behavior. Comportment's an interesting topic all on its own. Again, I could probably do a whole other video on that. The whole thing about feminine comportment is, of course, something like throwing a ball or doing a push-up, video below, or riding a bicycle, also video below, are not feminine. And this is where all of my material really leads to in the grand scheme of things, is that there are masculine behaviors, there are feminine behaviors, and the feminine ones are not sporty, they're not fit. It's not feminine to be sweaty and flushed and have yourself a nasty little case of bicycle face. Just a quick little note here, I did already do a video on bicycle face, I will link that down below, but for a quick recap, Bicycle face was a phony medical affliction that was created by actual medical experts, by real doctors, and it was done in the late 19th and early 20th century, at the time when the bicycle was new and we were still wearing full floor-length skirts. It was intended to scare women away from the bicycle in particular, but physical activity in general, by saying that you're going to be sweaty and dirty, and your hair is going to get messy, and you won't be pretty anymore, and then you won't get a husband, and then you're ruined. And really... That's all about comportment, isn't it? That is about looking perfectly fresh all the time. I think I've mentioned in some other videos that if you look at advertisements from the bicycle face era, a lot of them are about pretty extreme hygiene. Using products we certainly wouldn't use for hygiene these days like Lysol and Listerine. You don't want to put that anywhere sensitive. And remaining dainty and fresh. For your husband, of course, you know, you didn't have any purpose for that for yourself. Like, it was really bad. It was really bad in those days. Not that we're perfect now, but, you know, we have come a long way, as they say. One of these days, I'll do a video on advertisement from the Edwardian era in particular. Whoo, there was some, there was some questionable stuff in that. So the whole point of this, of Bicycle Face, of talking about comportment and people like Irving Strauss, who insisted that this was some innate ability born in an AFAB feminine body that meant we couldn't throw a ball correctly has had this long lasting decades, centuries even long lasting effect on how women approach physical activity and sport in general. The idea is still out there that girls can't throw, which is completely ridiculous. If you're trained to, you can throw. If you're trained to, you can do push-ups. If you're trained to, you can ride a bicycle. No human is born knowing how to do any of these things. It's all through training. But it was all meant to create fear around women not being perfect enough for a man to want you. I mean, queerness wasn't a thing to most people back then, so okay. But still, it is so ridiculously, I mean, over-the-top heteronormative and queerphobic. It's it's. It's a whole other area of study in its own right. What Jung was doing, without knowing it yet, without the word being coined yet, was agnotology. Again, for those who have not watched all my previous videos, quick recap. Agnotology is the study of ignorance, how it's created, and how it's spread deliberately. She was looking at a particular area of human behavior and the ignorance around a particular human phenomenon. So this is just one more example. There's millions of them out there of how agnotology and gender studies work really well together. And in fact, gender studies and women's studies was one of the sort of roots, the founding pieces that went into agnotology being officially named and codified in the mid nineties. And that's one of the things that makes agnotology fun and interesting. It's not just St sitting there and saying, well, that used to be correct and this is what's correct now. It's finding those little bits of information that are out there that people just take as so normal. Even today, there's a lot of people who still believe it's just perfectly biologically acceptable that boys can throw well and girls can't. But no, we know better now. And it's up to us today to get that out into the world so that girls have the opportunity to learn. Boys aren't forced to learn if they don't want to. You can be whatever gender somewhere in between or completely outside of the binary if that's what you prefer as well. And throwing has nothing to do with where you are 
in your gender identity. <laughs> it's not biological. There's nothing in the anatomy of the shoulder or the chest or having breasts, for example, that mean you can't throw well. People of all cup sizes can throw if they learn the throwing skills. It's simply that you need to learn the skills. Agnotology ultimately is about looking at those things that people aren't questioning, the things that we take as so completely normal that people don't even realize, wait a sec, we got to step back and actually look at that. And that I think is what was happening when when Strauss wrote in the 60s and when Iris Marion Young took that on in the 1980s and went, ah, you think that's normal. Ah, you think that's a given. It's not a given. Looking at how bodies are policed, how behavior is policed, how comportment is enforced in different types of bodies, particularly around gender, but it can be anything. It can be race. It can be disability. You name it. That is a big part of what we do in both gender studies and agnotology. And it's a part of why they intersect so well and work together so well. I mean, they really are the peanut butter and chocolate of academic disciplines. By which I mean they're great on their own, but oh, they're so much better together. Ooh, that reminds me. I have peanut butter cups in the freezer. As always, thank you so much for watching. Please like, subscribe, share, and do all the clicky things in the boxes and buttons down below. I've got some links down there for you for some previous videos that talk about some of these concepts as well. So please go watch those. And as always, lift heavy, fight the patriarchy, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye. Mm. Mm. They really are better frozen. Mm. Oh. Watch this stuff.